Right. Are we back? Uh, yes. Worst marathon ever. Hey, everybody. Welcome. But be warned, this is the worst marathon ever. On the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, that gets my goat Don't feet. do that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And I will try and keep it brief. This episode is going to be Joss Whedon is my master now. Did, didn't did Announcer Man say that in an old episode? He did. Yeah. And, 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 and sadly, it, sounded... it was because of Dollhouse. Oh, wow. <laughs> One of the panels I got to go to was just Joss by himself answering questions. And I'd seen him do this a bunch of times. But this the man who came out on this panel was not the Joss Whedon that I used to know. He, he was always such a young guy when he would come into the video store where I worked. It was just like, wow, that guy is... No, he's not my dad's age. He's a young man, and look at the things that he's accomplished. But in the last couple of years... He has really aged, uh, and he's lost most of his hair, and uh, I think it's just from from overwork, from stress. So, but this it, are you sure it's not just from male pattern baldness, and he's gotten to the age where it just all falls out? Because yeah, well, yeah, he's that, had that all along. You can tell as his forehead kept creeping up <laughs> and up and up, and it wasn't because he was really surprised and he was just raising his eyebrows. It's because his hair was going. Okay, but like he just hit from his posture and the fact that he was standing up, but he was sort of leaning over and the things that he kept saying, I got the impression this guy's really, really tired. And, uh, you know, I felt for him. He's a funny, funny guy in person and he was trying to make us laugh, but it was just, it felt, it seemed like a boxer after the, the bout and he's being interviewed and he's trying to put a, you know, He's trying to make he's, it sound like his head like he's is not still got hurting energy and his and ears yeah. are ringing and his, he can feel he's just trying to keep the blood from gushing from his nose bef- until the <laughs> interview is over. And that, that's how it felt. He was saying these things and he was on. Uh, and by on, you know, it's just like sometimes when you know your center of attention, you want to entertain. Right. And I could hear that he was doing that. And I, I kept thinking, Joss, you don't need to do that. Everybody in this room loves you. And loves the things that you have accomplished, or we wouldn't have stood in line to see you. You don't have to be funny. We, we, you just just tell things uh, like they are. But he was very, very funny. Anyway, I was just impressed with him. But he kept talking about how busy he is and how tired he is, and that he, you know, I'm not going to be able to get to everything. Uh, somebody asked about Doctor Evil, Doctor Evil, Doctor Horrible too, and he sort of shrugged and he said, "I had the choice to do Doctor Horrible too." Or to, to work on Shield, and and I chose to do Shield. I'm sorry. I'd still like to be able to do the sequel to Doctor Horrible. I, I love all those people, and, and it was a great experience. Um, but it just seemed like that would be better for me, for my career, and for you know, in the long run. And uh, maybe when I'm done with Avengers too, we'll have a window in which we can do that. And he's like, but I'm you know, I'm sorry but I made my choice kind of thing. And I was just like, wow, he sounded defeated, even though he should be on the top of the world. Anyhow, there were a lot of Buffy questions and a lot of Avengers questions. And he would have people ask questions and then he would answer and they would go on to the other end and he'd try and make us laugh. But I could tell that he was just like, oh, I really need a nap. And because you guys made me famous uh, and you guys supported me after alien resurrection or whatever i owe it to you guys to have this <laughs> this panel and and i thought that that was neat he was talking about the genesis of the avengers and that when he was first offered the gig before he started writing he sat down with all of the actors who were already established in their characters and said you know what would you like to do what would you like to see and 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 the one that 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 he mentioned specifically, it made me laugh so hard as he sat down with Chris Hemsworth and to talk to him about Thor, and he said, you know, a lot of the stuff that I put in Avengers was from his experiences growing up with Liam, and he's like, and Liam, you know, was always sick of being in his shadow, and sometimes would use his ability to make Liam's where Liam's really weren't <laughs> to fool with him and stuff, and I realized that he was lying, but he did it in such a, a droll, serious way that it took a second before we laughed. 
And he, yeah, he just, he talked about that there was an episode of, oh, the final episode of Angel, which was the Buffy spinoff. Um, a, a major character dies at the, in the final episode. And that was a really emotional, uh, it might not even have been the final episode because two major characters die right before the end of that series. And they had this extraordinarily emotional shoot. And afterward, he said, hey, let's just go, the three of us, uh, out to have tacos or Thai food or something like that. And they went and they were all so exhausted that they just slumped and ate in silence for like 45 minutes and didn't say a word. And he said, I had to put that in a movie. And that's why I did the shawarma scene in Avengers was from that day of shooting Angel. I don't know. That sort of stuff is so cool. And until we see it done badly, people won't realize what an awesome achievement Avengers was. He made it look easy as hell. He really did. To give all these characters something to do and have them interact in an interesting way and to have Hawkeye have interesting stuff to do, whereas he's not magical and he doesn't have any powers and he doesn't he wasn't frozen for 70 years and all that stuff. Hawkeye he is interesting. Doesn't even get a gun. He has to use a friggin' bow and arrow. And, you know, just the way that there's humor and lightness, even though you never feel like the world isn't in danger. There is weight, but there's also joy. And that, and I, gosh, I keep pounding on Man of Steel, but sorry, you guys pounded on me for a fucking hour and Gotham City and every building in Gotham City. There, there, there was no joy in that movie at all, and it was, it was all weight. When you were talking about Gotham City, did you mean Metropolis? I did mean Metropolis. See, you're right. I didn't see the movie. <laughs> the, the, the thing that makes us care about these characters any character it doesn't even have to be in a superhero film is that they're vulnerable or they feel pain or they're in danger and sometimes you know it's it's by showing them get hurt but other times it's by showing them you know try and play it off with a joke or you know recognize the absurdity of a situation and and call attention to it and all that stuff. Anyway, he just he does all sorts of fun things through Avengers that, like I said, until a bad sequel comes out or until a bad imitation comes out, I don't think people can recognize. Yeah, you and I, you're a big fan of soccer, of, of football. And I've <laughs> gone to professional matches where if the players are really technically proficient, it looks easy. Because the ball goes where they want it to go and there's somebody right there to get it and they kick it back and they're in the next place and they're just moving forward and it all looks like, wow, I could do that. But then you'll see people on the field struggle and they kick the ball and it goes not where it's supposed to or it goes right up to where an opposing player is or it hits somebody and all that or it goes out of bounds and it's like, shoot, I know this guy is, is athletic. I know this guy works hard at his craft. But it doesn't look easy when he does it. And, and anyhow, uh, that's just something that with Joss, he said that he had an advantage in making Avengers where a lot of people might not have had it. And, and the advantage was when he was a boy in the 70s, he read this book. He read Avengers and he it, for him, it wasn't hard to believe that a god would hang out with a soldier, would hang out with an assassin, would hang out with a brilliant inventor would hang out with somebody who could shrink and all that stuff. And even though they had different power levels and different backgrounds and maybe different planets of origin, they were all on the same team and they made it work. And sometimes they would bring attention to it. It's like, you and I shouldn't be friends, but we're on the same team. And that makes us more than friends kind of stuff. And he said, when I would talk to people about the project, I could tell whether they got it or not. Because if they didn't, they'd have to be convinced that Captain America and Iron Man could exist in the same world. And he said, when I saw, when I see other people who are making superhero films, I can see that the director has to be convinced that this could work, that this could be believable, that audiences are going to buy this. And, and that's a tremendous hurdle when your director doesn't even believe in the source material, how, how you can convince the... And he used Green Lantern as a definitive example because... He says Martin Campbell is a great director and he's made all these movies that are really wonderful. But he didn't believe that there could be 
space policeman with magic rings and all that stuff. You know, it's, you could see him struggling with the source material. He was out of his element. And for me, that's just in my wheelhouse. I'm fine with that. And I, I love being able to tell these stories. And it's like, oh, and wouldn't it be neat? And plus, I knew all these things with the characters where if somebody, if they didn't grow up with them, would have to consult the writer or, or you know, somebody that actually knew and all that. And, and again, I mean, it's sort of a self-effacing thing that he's saying. He's saying, you know, I had this advantage. But what he was really saying was I was born for this job. Right. I was more qualified for this job than a lot of other people. But he was saying it in just this nice sort of way of, you know, lucky me, I got to do this thing. Are there other people out there you think that are similar to him that could take a... I mean, Sam Raimi was a big fan of Spider-Man before he was the director of it, right? But, like, Zack Snyder, wasn't he a big comic book fan? I mean, he did 300, he did uh, Watchmen before he did Superman. Maybe it's just because the tone of those are so much different than a Superman comic. That's why he went so wrongly. See, but... I, I, don't, I don't know. I know that he knew Watchmen backward and forward. Right. And to hear him talk... He just revered everything. To him, it was like scripture. And he's like, and I want it to be as close as possible. I want to include the dialogue exactly the way it was. And, you know, for him, it was a sacred thing that he was trying to bring to a much wider audience. And yeah, I, I'll be the bad guy. I think it's Nolan. I think Nolan is the bad guy for, for Man of Steel. Wait, I don't know. You're going to be the bad guy, and but Nolan's the bad guy. You I'm going to be, be the, the bad guy. Well, no, I'm saying Christopher Nolan is <laughs> is revered, is deified. The the way that people talk about Nolan is the way I'm talking about Whedon. Right. To me, Joss Whedon can do no wrong, and when he does wrong, it's somebody else's fault. Uh huh. And that you know that's too bad that I feel that way. Um, and, and Christopher Nolan has made a lot of people happy with his films, but I just. There, there. You need to have an understanding of what you're doing and an understanding of who Superman is. And maybe for a lot of people, the Man of Steel Superman is valid. He's fine. He's, or, or maybe it was time for something new. It was like Superman was created in 1938. It's time to put away that 1938 image of a, of what a Superman would be. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I. I... I was mentioning it to you earlier today that yeah, some some guys that were, were talking today about that Superman movie and they were they were irritated at the end when Superman was going to be Clark Kent and go to the Daily Planet and wear the glasses and somehow fool people. They're like, oh no, they're doing that stupid thing again with the glasses. Oh, that's so lame. And I was just like, oh, you guys are so wrong. If you go to go watch those old Superman, that's the, like the best stuff in there. The funnest stuff is when Christopher Reeves is playing Clark Kent. And it's so different. He's so different than when he's Superman. He's a completely different person. So it's not that unbelievable that someone would not recognize him because he put on the glasses and everything else because he's also completely bumbling and goofy and, and awful and nobody would think oh that's Superman of course well there's that moment in the 78 kind of similar. movie where he's going to reveal his identity to Lois yeah and she's she doesn't see what he's doing and he takes off the glasses and suddenly star stands up straighter and he physically becomes Superman. Yeah, and his voice changes even. His voice becomes deeper and he says, Lois. And said, so, oh, uh, nothing, Lois. I was just thinking that maybe we should uh, go. Eh, uh, oh, don't kick me. Oh, shoot. Does that sign say kick me on my back? Yeah, I, I don't know how much we've talked about the Richard Donner movie. That looks easy, too. All the, <laughs> All the stuff in that. I mean, if we knew how much work went into just making the guy fly... We would be crying right now. But the, the tonal balance in the 1978 Superman, because that was my introduction to the character, really. I mean, maybe I'd seen Super Friends before then, but I don't know. Because that's how I was introduced to him, it's just like, oh, okay, that's who Superman is. I didn't have to buy it. But then it's like, oh, shoot, how do you ever measure up with that? And to yeah, to hear your friends or your coworkers complain, uh, you you told me a little bit more about what they said. and that, And I've heard people... Talk about, you know, that this is more realistic or this is this is how it would be and all that stuff. But if somebody made a David and Goliath movie 
and David killed the giant with a sling. And audiences are like, oh, come on. Again with the sling and the rock in the forehead. And it's like, I, oh, I was hoping that they would skip that part. Or the part with it. Uh, the, oh, here comes the Pharaoh's army. And they're going through the, the, the Red Sea that's been parted. And now the waters come back and they wash away all of the Pharaoh's got. Oh, again with that. To me, this, there's no difference. <laughs> It's just like, one is the story, one is who this character is, and and one is not. One is departing. I mean, you know, the whole David and Goliath thing, the whole story yeah, is the like, boy able to defeat the giant with a, a rock. Yeah, it's people going, oh, God, and now uh, they're still making David smaller than Goliath. I mean, haven't we gotten over that whole thing? Gosh, David is not just some little guy. How can I care about this little nerdy guy? This small guy beating this giant. That's just silly. How long did we talk on that Man of Steel episode? Too long. Yeah, it was definitely, really a long time. Definitely too long. And every episode since then, we've and every, harped on it a little further. Well, it's weird that I am so upset about it. Because I'm trying to think if I was this upset when Batman and Robin came out. Because Batman and Robin was a turd. And if you recall the damage that did to the Batman franchise and Warner Brothers saying, oh, well, you know, it's not viable anymore. We're, after one misstep that still made over $100 million domestic, they're like, ah, well, we're not going to make Batman movies anymore. Wow, that was just, it was heartbreaking to me because, you know, I wanted to go make movies and I would love to have been able to work on a Batman movie and all that. And to find out that they're not doing it anymore... Maybe we don't live in that era anymore because now if something goes wrong, you can always just reboot it as long as there's a little bit of fuel left in the tank. But I, yeah, I thought that there were a ton of missteps in the Man of Steel first movie to the point where when they make a sequel, do they acknowledge those mistakes and try and proceed from there and, and, and fix them? Or do they say, hey, we've made our bed and this movie made a lot of money, so we must have done things right. We're going to stick with the things that we established in this first movie. I don't know. Um, so tell me more about Joss Whedon. Okay, yeah. just I, I have very little <laughs> more I'm going to say about it, except for that he he's tired and he's not able to do all the stuff that he wants to do. And, and somebody asked him, let's say that Warner Brothers came to you now and they said, you know, the, the Wonder Woman movie that you were going to do a few years ago, do it for us now. We'll, get, we'll pay you anything you want. Would you do it? And he said, no. Like that end of subject. And he says, again, I'm, I'm just tired and I don't have enough time to do everything for anybody. I don't No, that was a bad experience and it didn't work out. And I got fired from the project and I've moved on and I want to do other things. And somebody said, well, okay, if you could work on any project, what would your dream project be? And I thought, oh, that's a cool question. And they said, you, you, you can do anything that you want. What would it be? And maybe you can guess what he said. Avengers 2. No, he said, I would make a sequel to Serenity. Yeah? If I could do anything. And a lot of people clapped. And I thought, oh, that's neat. It's neat that he still holds that up as you know his best experience ever and all that stuff. And, and he said that they were going to do more comics. And, and you know he said if somebody came along and they wanted to do another series you know, set in the Firefly universe or whatever. I'd love to be part of that. But it just, it was strange to hear him a little bit less active, I felt. I mean, he talked about his position of influence with Marvel Studios now. And, you know, he gets to see all the scripts and work on them so that, you know, nothing interferes with his plans for Avengers 2 and, and also so that they all tonally go together. And he's like, you know, I just didn't want... Cap in my movie did not sound like the you know Cap in in their movie or, or Thor and and uh, maybe he just needs a vacation because you know in his last vacation instead of taking a vacation he decided hey I'm gonna make a movie during my two weeks off <laughs> and you know what movie making is like that's not a vacation right yeah I don't know if he's that tired. And he's really only made one big time movie. Imagine what it'll be like by the time he's done with Avengers 2 and Avengers 3. Well, but at the same time, he made Much Ado About Nothing after Avengers. He directed the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. pilot and he's been executive producer of S.H.I.E.L.D. He's written Avengers 2 
and uh, you know has whatever overseeing over Guardians of the Galaxy and, and Cap 2 and Thor 2 and uh, you know whatever else the guy does anyway I, he's stu- stuck by his guns too that Avengers 2 is going to be smaller than Avengers 1 and I know we've talked about that on this show before that nobody will allow you to go smaller but if they do if he actually gets away with it and makes a smaller scale movie than Avengers 1 I think people would be like, whoa, that that shouldn't have worked, and yet it did work. Uh, The more we can care about these characters, the stronger the movie's going to be. And uh, so you know who the villain is for Avengers 2. They they did announce that at Comic-Con. And uh, it's Ultron is the bad guy. And I don't know much about Ultron, really. Yeah, I don't really know. All I know is that he's basically just immensely powerful. And he was created by Hank Pym, right? Yeah. So that means that Hank Pym will be in this film? I don't know. Now, there is a, they, an Ant-Man film that is actually in production or is it's, there's headed a script, towards it. And it's got a release it's date. green lit or but whatever. But it's coming out after Avengers 2. So it's possible that Avengers will introduce Hank Pym and then he'll become Ant-Man in the movie. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's also possible that Ultron will not be created by Pym. That... Thanos will create him or some other character that we don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I know that he's just immensely, immensely powerful in, and super dangerous. And it's basically like Doctor Doom or, or one of those characters that just has so much that it takes all the Avengers to fight him. But I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a story. No, I know what he looks like, but I've never read a book with Ultron in it. And for me, that's good. Because if they do change something, I'm not married to the idea of Hank Pym building him as a... I think he was supposed to be like a, a security guard at, at a superhuman prison or something like that. He's like, I want to make a robot that will be able to predict what any of these guys can do and adapt himself. If any of these guys got out, he would be able to stop them. And he ended up making it too strong. And it's like, no, I'm going to stop anybody. I'm going to stop you guys kind of thing. I, I don't know. That's what I think. Ultron is. If that doesn't sound right to you, I could be wrong. I don't know any better. So if you're talking to the listener, then that's fine. But if you're talking to me, then I'm in the same boat. Uh, No, I was talking to you because, yeah, the listener may be able to correct me and go ahead, do it in the forums. I would be curious to find out what... And and is there a difference between the Ultron in the real universe? Yeah. And the Ultimate Universe... I'm kind of curious about that too, although only curious in like looking at concentration camp photos and stuff like that. I'm not a fan of the ultimate universe, but again, one last thing about Joss Whedon, somebody of course asked him about killing characters and that, and he said, you know, I never create a character just so I can kill him. People act like I do and all that, but I create these characters so that you care about them. And when bad things happen to people you care about, that's where drama comes in. And sometimes, yeah, they die, but, you know, sometimes they come back after I've killed them. And people are never complaining about that. (laughs) I thought that was neat. He was saying that so far we haven't killed any of the characters on S.H.I.E.L.D., but... If you're missing Agent Coulson, you can see him on the amazing... Or the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon? Yeah, he's the principal of the He's like the friggin' principal of the high school. And he won't he have a part in that S.H.I.E.L.D. show, or is he... Yeah, he... They're going from... He's after. on all of the art and stuff, and they're sort of using it as... Uh, using him as a connection between that and Avengers. Uh, Maria Hill is in the pilot as well. So that's neat, but... I kind of don't want to know. I know people already know how Coulson comes back. And I hope it's done in a way I, I can accept it. Because I, I, that death was so strong and so good yeah. in Avengers. So he's coming back. It's not going back to the before he died then. That's what I think. I, I, I was hoping that maybe he just shows up in the pilot and then Avengers happens and he's gone from the rest of the show. But I don't know. I, I guess we'll know in September when it starts up. But. Yeah, I guess we will. Uh, the, the man has his priorities straight as far as how to tell stories. I mean, all of his stuff seems to be very human, and he, he, he likes character and conflict within characters, not just you're bad and I'm good, and so that's where the conflict is, but, 
you know, I don't know what to do. My, my enemy is me kind of stuff. And, and that's just as strong and just as valid, but you don't see it a lot or you don't see it as much. Anyway, I will leave you alone. It's gotten late. Yeah, I, I really enjoy everything that he does. I and mean, we've talked over and over again about that. And uh, he's yet to really let me down. Even the most uninspiring thing that I saw of him, which was probably the Dollhouse uh, series, even that had some great moments and some really good stuff in it that was really fun and worth watching. And so, yeah, I look forward to everything that he does. I'd like to go see that Much Ado About Nothing. Um, so, yeah, I'm a fan and I'm looking forward to the next installment. I know I'm, I, I can't think of a better person to be that guy that's in charge and kind of looking over the scripts and making th- sure everything doesn't suck and that it jibes and so forth. It's, it's good to have someone like that and... You know, I mean, Chris Nolan was kind of that guy for DC and uh, didn't work out as well so far. For the people that love Man of Steel, it did work out. And that's that's cool. And, you know, it, it, there are people that don't like what Joss does, I'm sure. But wait until somebody directs Avengers 4 that's not Joss Whedon. And then you can change your tune. <laughs> you know, and that's not to say that other people aren't as capable... And that other people don't love the character. It's just that he has been fighting for the things that he believes in for so long. Whether it's network network executives, you know, who have the stupidest notes. You know, we can't market a show with Slayer in the title and things like that. And he's become confident enough to, to fight for the things that he thinks are really important and then bend on the things that ultimately aren't important. And, you know, sometimes there are other ways to go where, you know, people always talk, use Brett Ratner as an example of a bad director. I don't think Brett Ratner is a bad director at all, but I think he's a very malleable director. And whatever the producers want or whatever tone they want, he'll do. None of his movies feel like a Brett Ratner film. You know what I mean? He doesn't have a very strong voice. Right. He's sort of just a, a journeyman that comes in, kind of. Well, you notice in Much Ado About Nothing, Joss Whedon's. You, you always notice his dialogue, but <laughs> in that case, I'm assuming that you won't be able to notice his dialogue. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I, I'll, I'll sit down and watch it, and we can see if there is. Something, something that, that stands out jossy. in there because yeah, his dialogue is so recognizable, like you said, but also just the themes. I don't know. This is this will be fun, and you know he talked about it as, you know, I I didn't have to worry about writing and rewriting and getting the 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 script fighting shape because you know it was written hundreds of years ago and it's perfect as it is and and so he got to concentrate on other things. We'll see. Maybe there'll be just really dumb things in S.H.I.E.L.D. or dumb things in Avengers 2. But so far, I think he's earned my trust. And so, until I get let down, you know, he's he, he remains my master. Joss Whedon is your master? Yes. Joss Whedon is my master now. Who said that? I don't know. All, All right. right, everybody. Thanks for listening to another Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. That gets my goat. <laughs> Please don't say that anymore. <laughs> Best marathon ever. Best! Oh, wow. shoot, shoot! I totally oh, blew it. Who's arrogant now? Worst marathon ever. Thanks for listening, folks. See you later. That ain't funny, man. That gives my goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Go what, on. What, what is going on? <laughs> uh, is she asking where you are? Or? Yeah, she's just asking when I was coming home. You're, you're ruining the no edit thing by am, paying am, attention i'm trying to, i'm trying it? to do this quietly so that it doesn't cause any problem while still listening i guess i'm the one talking <laughs>